All right, so our webinar has started and attendees are gonna be coming in and I see them, their names and we're gonna move over. Um, Nancy Gilbert, hopefully. Right. So I don't see Nancy there. So everyone, we're just waiting for our chair and she should be joining us. And I'm just gonna give her a call. Oh, there we are, okay. Okay, so. Join as panelists. Okay, Nancy. We have you as a panelist. Are you there? We could hear you a minute ago. I don't know if you're muted. Okay, now you're muted. Start right. video. Okay, Oops. we can hear you. But it, okay, now can you see me? Yes, oh, now we can see you. Okay, woo. So Nancy, we've started the webinar and uh, we're recording. So if you want to start us off. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> All these hiccups. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and renewed by uh, Governor Maura Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instruction on, board, on the Board of Health's posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. We will post on the Board of Health website a recording of the proceedings as soon as it's technologically possible after this meeting. All approved Board of Health meetings are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. So I will now open the June um, 8th, 9th, June 8th, <laughs> um, Board of Health meeting at 5.33 with the roll call. So I see Tim, are yeah. you? Lauren? Lauren, can you unmute? Oops, Lauren's muted. Well, I'll do Prem Premola. Here. And I don't think Maureen, Maureen sent an email that she didn't know if she would have um, internet connection where she was. So I think she's absent. But Lauren, can you hear Lauren? I can't hear her. I see her. No, Lauren's gone. Uh, Lauren? Are you there, Lauren? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So the first thing we will do is review um, and vote on the, the minutes of our May 11th meeting. I have one correction, um, two corrections. Under topics not anticipated by the chair, number three, I wrote a letter to the town council in support of the zero waste Amherst proposal. And number four would be that I had um, asked the board of health to consider writing an LGBTQ plus equity statement. Um, so those were the only changes I had. Did anyone else? See anything that you'd like to change? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm feeling a little um, feisty today because I, I went to the dentist. 
Uh, this is probably my last um, meeting. Um, note, I was marked absent because of technical difficulty on a couple of votes. I think one of the votes was I entered into the chat. Um, I think it was the tobacco license, the new tobacco license. So I want to know if that to be correct or what what happens if it's internet difficulty that makes you miss the vote so we can add we could say lord mills parentheses technological problems and not have absent do you think that would be adequate jennifer i, I think that would be accurate yeah so that would be that from absent to technological difficulty. And how do you, does that seem okay, Lauren? Okay, great. She gave a thumbs up. Tim or Premila, do you have any other comments, corrections? For the minutes? I do not. Tim? I do not. Yeah. Would someone like to make a motion to accept them as amended? Motion to accept as amended. I can second, second it. Second it. <laughs> I mean, second Tim and I second it. Um, all in favor? Tim? Aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy on. Okay. Thank you. Now we will open to public comment. And um, the chair or I will recognize members of the public to express their views for up to two minutes. And when called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name, preferred pronouns, and your address. At this point, the Board of Health will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during this public comment. So do we have any? No hands are up. Yeah. No hands are up. Yeah. Okay, so no public comment. Oh, there is, there is somebody with a hand up, if you can. Okay. All right. Um, Jill Sherman, if you can say your name and where you live and <coughs> unmute yourself. All right, your hand is up. So I'm gonna lower your hand. Am I allowed to make a comment? Yes, please yes, do. Yes, you are. Please okay. do. Okay, I don't know if I if you want me to make a comment on last month's meeting. All I want to say is I think you're all doing a good job. I exercise shop and visit friends in Amherst. I'd like to see more publicity about the necessity of having the booster to the COVID vaccine and the fact that the COVID is still around. That's all. I'd like to see the health department give more publicity and also have uh, more clinics. But I know the state may not allow you to get more vaccines for more clinics. Thank you, Jill. Okay. Any other? I think that's it. Hands raised, okay. So next, and we're right on time for old business. So old business, I am so pleased. And I cannot say more than enough for Jen supporting this and students from the School of Public Health for the past since February of 2022 have been working on a community health needs assessment for the town. And Emily Connors has been on this program from day one. She was in four plus one undergrad and she just graduated and she's been the leader on this project with Kyle O'Connor, who was 
uh, so impressive and had time. He's now an employee of the health department. Um, and he's going to be in his the la final year of his master's. Catherine Grella is in the last uh, semester of her master's. James De Silvo is, I think he's going into his senior year. Um, and uh, Kyle joined us in the fall, Catherine a little later, James a little later, and this past semester, Neha Radhal Carr, oh man, Rahal Carr joined us in February and has been a great asset. So I'm going to turn it over to this wonderful team who's worked so hard with um, minimal resources to conduct this community health assessment. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Did I promote everyone correctly? Kyle, can you take a look at the attendees? Did I need to move anyone else over? I'm just moving James over. But Thank you. Oh, I apologize, James. Okay. Oh, there are guys. <laughs> All right. Are we good to start? Yes, you are, Emily. Right. Can everyone see that? I don't know if everyone just wants to show their face and just say their name again so people know who you are because you're all so wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm Emily. I'm Kyle. I'm Hi. Catherine. I'm James. Neha, are you there? Yes, I'm Neha. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So I guess we can start our presentation now. Thank you, everyone, for giving us the time um, to present this. This will be the 2022-2023 Amherst Community Health Needs Assessment. So for a little background, community assessment is the process of identifying key health needs, assets, and challenges of a community through systematic, comprehensive, quantitative, and qualitative data collection and analysis. So the specific aims for our project were to identify needs, prioritize decisions, identify ways to reach at-risk disenfranchised populations, address systemic health problems and concerns of our community members, promote equity, and guide advocacy efforts and policy development. So our project was broken down into three main phases. The first phase started about a year and a half ago in February of 2022, as Nancy said. Um, this included a report and a presentation on descriptive quantitative data um, that included a description of Amherst and its history, demographics, and general health status and population vital statistics. We got these from the US Census <laughs> and um, from the CDC. Then we had phase two, which was in summer of 2022, which included descriptive, quantitative, and qualitative data, um, including determinants of health, government, and policymaking. And then the final phase, phase three, started in fall of 2022 and is finishing up now. And in this phase, we gathered community members' views through qualitative data regarding key health concerns. Um, we mainly did this through key informant interviews and listening sessions. So our framework for the project as a whole was the social determinants of health. Um, the social determinants of health are non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. So we can think of them as the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of our daily lives. So these forces can include, uh, can include economic policies and systems, development agendas, social norms and policies, racism, climate change, and political systems. And through a broader awareness of how to better incorporate the social determinants of health throughout um, many aspects of public health work, we can transform and strengthen our community's capacity to advance health equity. So here is an image that breaks down the five categories um, included in the social determinants of health. So we have education, access, and quality, healthcare quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. 
Um, so we have a little more background on the social determinants of health for those of you who are not as familiar. Um, it might seem weird that we're talking about education or um, neighborhood environments, social context, all of that um, in relation to health, but we do know that it all is very connected and very important. Um, so education, access, and quality shapes opportunities for learning, skill development, social integration, and future socioeconomic prospects, which influence overall well-being and health equity. Um, next, we have healthcare access and quality. So we think about things like insurance coverage, um, the ability to treat chronic illnesses, health literacy, access to mental health services, um, specialists, and PCPs are all super important. Um, then we have neighborhood and built environment. So human-made surroundings and environments in a town that influence overall community health. So things like parks, recreational spaces, roads and infrastructure, um, gathering spaces, as well as proximity to grocery stores and transportation. Um, next, we have social and community context. So we know that strong social support and a sense of belonging can contribute to the emotional well-being and resilience of individuals and communities. Um, it can reduce the risk of mental health issues, can enhance physical health outcomes, and can provide opportunities for health education, awareness, and behavior changes. Um, and lastly, we have economic stability, which can lead to higher employment rates, greater income levels for individuals and families. And when people have access to these more stable jobs and sufficient incomes, they're better able to afford essential um, goods and services. So things like healthy and nutritious food, housing, transportation, and healthcare. Um, and before we jump into the sections, we did just want to note that this presentation is a um, very broad overview of our final report. We go into a lot more detail in that document. So um, for more details on our findings and recommendations, we'll refer people to that document. So I'll start us off with economic stability as a determinant of health. So some quick statistics. Uh, in 2021, about 10% of people aged 16 years or older that were in the workforce were unemployed, which is fairly high for Massachusetts. It's about three times the uh, state average. Um, and then about, well, more than half of renters in Amherst were paying over 35% of their household income on rent. Um, and the national average there is around 30%, maybe 29. Um, and if you're higher than that, then you're considered cost burden. Um, and then Amherst spends about a quarter of what Northampton spends on health department staff and less than half of what East Hampton spends. Um, and so some questions that we were asking when we were doing this were, well, how do college students affect the economic functionality of our town? Um, how are, how are the non-student community members affected by that? Um, how has access to affordable and subsidized housing changed in Amherst? And then how does Amherst spending on health affect its citizens? So some findings. Um, the biggest thing that we found was due to the overcrowding on the college campuses, the colleges will sort of make students find rent or find places to live off campus. And students are very easy targets for landlords to raise the prices of rent. So then prices of rent would skyrocket, which would make vulnerable populations that can't usually afford housing have an even harder time affording it. And then on top of that, it makes it harder to get quality food, good health care, access to transportation, et cetera. Um, and a quote that kind of embodies that is that rents are getting raised at proportions that you know regular people can't really keep up with. Landlords have all this power to raise as much rent as they want to. And it really puts vulnerable populations in a real crisis mode. Another thing we found was that the health spending in Amherst was a lot lower than in neighboring towns. And that means that there's fewer staff and resources and it prohibits lower income groups from receiving adequate care. And then we also found that uh, spending in Amherst downtown, um, the business improvement district uh, is only really a few people and they all own multiple, multiple businesses um, in the downtown area. So spending decisions are decided without a lot of input from the general public. Um, someone mentioned that it's going towards these pet projects that aren't contributing to the upliftment of people. 
Um, and then sort of a, a last thing we found was that there's classism in the town, especially in the school system, um, which causes a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression for the kids. Um, and a quote for that is, in a place like Amherst, that divide is going to weigh on someone's emotional and mental health. When you don't have much and you're constantly around people who have so much, it's hard. So some recommendations. Um, the biggest thing we can recommend for this is creating additional affordable and subsidized housing or trying to influence the school to create more dorms. Um, that gives citizens more money to spend on other things other than rent, such as transportation, healthy food, frequent health care, stuff like that. And then um, another thing we can recommend is supporting business development outside of Amherst downtown, because that sparks uh, sort of new business in new areas like the Mill District and South Amherst, these commercial pockets that aren't that could could live up to more and then um, inviting residents of the town to participate in what Amherst downtown does spend its money on instead of just solely these districts, property owners uh, creates a more accommodating and lively downtown. Okay, so next we're going to get into the neighborhood and built environment. So just as a bit of background, Amherst is built with a lot of natural green space and other areas for recreation. And we found in our analysis that a lot of residents actually consider these parks and green spaces to be one of the most beneficial assets Amherst has to offer. So this is a really big positive in the built environment that we found. With that being said, though, there are some negatives definitely to note. One of the most important ones being that 97% of Amherst residents live in a USDA designated food desert. This means that they have few or no convenient options to securing both affordable and healthy food, and that food for them is not easily accessible by foot or bus. So I wanted to note on the right, there's a graph by the US Census Tract, and it shows the percentage of households without a vehicle that are more than a half mile away from a supermarket. So you can see that UMass does have the most, but even Central Amherst and Amherst Center, those percentages are still high. So it's something we need to look at. And then from there, we wanted to consider different interventions. So interventions towards helping residents to get access to nutritious food in Amherst. And then we also wanted to look at the public transportation system. We wanted to see if there were shortcomings or gaps in that service. And then if there were gaps that we evaluated, we wanted to see how this could be improved for residents. So what we found was that as expected with the food desert, food is very hard for many residents to access comfortably. And there are a lot of transportation improvements that are also needed. A lot of residents noted also issues with the bag limit on the PVTA. There are dangerous road conditions and some gave personal anecdotes of injuries from potholes or other road conditions at night, such as poor lighting for adults that are getting older and can't see as well. So those are all things to consider with the built environment. And then we also found that the homeless are struggling and in some ways lacking the resources and support that they need to live their healthiest lives. So I put two quotes up here from some interviews that we did. One is on transportation and one is on food access, which are two of the most important issues we saw come up in built environment. So I'm just gonna read them here. I think making transportation more available would be helpful. I mean, I cannot state enough how much of an issue the transportation in this region is. You know, when UMass is on break, buses are running once an hour. It's just ludicrous. And the second on food insecurity, my first and number one answer is that the public health crisis of food insecurity is a really enormous one, and it's impacting a lot of Amherst residents. So for recommendations, the first one is that individuals just go out and see it firsthand. So maybe observe where residents are getting their food or what methods of transportation are being used. So seeing this firsthand will just allow individuals to become more immersed in the environment and then listen and observe, but more importantly, take action from this. For transportation, map out a plan to fix the dangerous roads, take a closer look at the bag limit that exists on the PVTA as this limits a lot of families from getting a week's supply of groceries home in one trip. 
and then continue to provide stable and consistent bus access for residents in town, even when students are out of town. For food access, look into initiatives to reduce food loss and food waste and see if some of that food loss or food waste could go to those that are food insecure and may need it more. Consider the existing benefits of nutrition assistance programs and what their available food options are, and then build more areas where individuals in the town can get food together. So maybe considering a community garden or farmers markets that run year round. Some residents stated that they had a bit of issues with the fact that the market ran in the fall and in the summer, but having something that runs year round could get individuals that live closer to maybe the downtown more easy food access. And then finally, our last recommendation was for homeless support. So just reevaluate and make improvements to homeless support, increase the resources for the homeless, and then forms and bikes that may only be available online. This is something that we saw come up some homeless individuals said that their forms that they needed to fill out were only accessible through a smartphone or a tablet. So not having those really hindered their ability to complete these. And then the bikes that are rentable in the downtown, I think those you also need a credit card and a phone to access. So just making those available to all would also be really awesome. Okay, next we're gonna talk about social and community context. So our focus areas going into phase three were how can we make the social services available in town easier to coordinate and access for those in need? Um, why are there so few recreational options for children and adults in town? And how do community members feel about the range of activities available? And how can we better perceive social engagement and belongingness for all residents? As well as what improvements can be made to be more consistent in communication and outreach to reach more community members. So as I said before, this is a very um, broad overview of the results. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that there are a lot more findings and recommendations in the final report, but these are the three um, main findings we wanted to highlight. So Amherst does have many valuable social services available. We have um, the Survival Center, Craig's Doors, all of these places, but the services are fragmented and difficult to coordinate. We heard from a lot of people that if you're struggling, um, you may need to go to three or four different places to meet all of your basic needs. So a place for food, um, a place for clothes, a place to take a shower, they may all be different. Um, so if you're already struggling, this can be a lot to manage and navigate. Um, also how individuals relate and interact with the town. Resources is affected by race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, et cetera. Um, so social engagement and community support is really affected by racial experiences in town, especially in Amherst, um, which can cause individuals to experience the available services and community outreach differently. Um, we heard from one participant that they felt there was something missing in Amherst that makes you really feel the disparities. Um, another person was talking about um, the local government and how there's a lack of diversity on boards and committees. And they felt as though everyone is coming with their own agendas and people are representing themselves, not the community. Um, and lastly, there are major holes in the recreation programs for children and adults. Um, there's a handful of sports available, but if your um, child isn't interested in those um, or has different abilities, they might need to turn to private entities, which can be much more expensive um, and just not feasible for many families. So for our recommendations, um, like I said, Amherst has a lot of valuable resources. Um, they're just fragmented. So putting in a town liaison or point person to help direct and connect individuals with the right resources could take a little bit of the burden off the individual's shoulders in terms of coordination and help them um, get back on their feet a little bit easier. Um, also support um, and expand the Crest Department and the Senior Center. This would help promote health and well-being for all town residents. Um, supporting the creation of a more diverse town government 
um, looking into having more diverse council members in terms of race, age, socioeconomic status, et cetera, um, could help better reflect the town population and highlight what the town can do better to address, address existing disparities. Um, and then lastly, we would suggest continuing the community health needs assessment to listen to more voices. Um, we tried to talk to as many people as possible, but due to limitations on resources and time, we couldn't talk to everyone, obviously. So um, continuing to get out there and get feedback from the community um, will help us kind of ensure interventions and policies are responsive to the di diverse needs of this community and are actually what they want. Okay, uh, moving on to education. Uh, the Amherst School District is split into solely the Amherst schools. Oh, wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the Amherst School District is split into solely the Amherst schools, which encompass the three elementary schools and the Amherst Pelham schools, which encompass the middle and the high school. So this equates to about 2,280 students combined. In regards to special populations, 32.8% of Amherst students are low income and 8% are registered as English language learners. In the high school specifically, 43.5% of students qualify as high needs. As mentioned in the introduction, education is a key social determinant of health in which it impacts lifelong well-being and opportunities. So to try to really understand and shed light on this background, uh, we came up with focus areas to address in the third phase of the project. Um, these focus areas are more specifically alluded to in the final document, but to really sum it up for the education section, uh, we sought to evaluate the accessibility of educational institutions, their capacity to meet community needs, and analyze factors affecting school dropout rates, while also assessing support services for diverse student populations. Next slide. So heavily summarized on the slide are our key findings through these interviews and listening sessions. Essentially, a breakdown of what we found is that teachers and education staff in the Amherst schools are very highly talked about and are consistently cited for going above and beyond for caring for students. However, teachers and staff may not feel supported by school and town administrators. Low income students, students of color, LGBTQIA students and English language learners may face additional barriers in accessing the same resources and educational opportunities as their peers. Students who are not pursuing a college track may feel under-supported and budget cuts may be impacting educational opportunities. And finally, COVID-19 has really heavily impacted student learning. These are quotes that we thought really encompass these points. Yeah. Did you wanna read those? Sorry. No, it's okay. They encompass these points, um, specifically regarding the barriers that those marginalized communities may face. Um, and it's important to emphasize that there are many more in the final report. These aren't the only ones. So our overarching recommendation is that more outreach be done to address the gaps to quality and access in education, specifically in regards to marginalized communities and the Board of Health can support the implementation of these. So more specific recommendations are below and are illustrative in our final report. Um, these include creating culturally responsive school programming, uh, creating more opportunities for career exploration, which essentially includes broadening access to vocational opportunities for non-college bound students. Um, increasing family engagement and support, which is extending the timings of extracurriculars, um, as Emily said, addressing barriers in communication between the schools and families and engaging marginalized communities. Um, the next recommendation is in continuing to develop and implement plans to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on student learning. And finally, we recommend an increase in mental health support for students and staff. So the final pillar um, of the social determinants of health is healthcare access and quality. For this section, we focused on the many different healthcare services provided in the town, including primary care services, mental health services, dentistry, senior care, and more. The Misante Health Center and Tapestry Health are just some examples of programs that help increase access to healthcare services within the town, especially for underserved populations. Through this community health assessment, we wanted to understand how accessible these services are, where are their shortcomings, and how improvements can be made to better serve the community. In our findings, one of the biggest concerns of the community was the lack of access to primary care providers and dentists. There was also a large general lack of knowledge and understanding of the Misante Health Center. 
There was also a need for a more diverse language representation, especially for the social services of the town. And there is a general concern over environmental issues, infectious diseases, and extreme weather brought upon by climate change. And there was also a concern over rising substance abuse in Amherst. Below are some quotes from a community member and a Misante health employee that reflect some of these findings. Um, one quote was, getting a doctor's appointment is so hard. And the other is from a Misante health employee who said, people don't know that we're here. People don't understand what an FQHC is and we are not in urgent care. So based on these findings, the first major recommendation is looking how the Amherst Public Health Department compares to its neighboring towns. It doesn't have the access to staff and resources it needs to go above and beyond the projects they're already managing. Adding a community outreach worker position would allow them to be more accessible in communal spaces, to educate and provide free tools to keep Amherst residents healthy, especially the underserved populations. It would also be beneficial if the health department were to bring awareness to mental health concerns of the town and implement programs to its residents. The community health assessment also found that expanding the SHARPS program would allow residents who are struggling to deposit the SHARPS safely at no extra cost and to address the rising problem of substance abuse. So our second recommendation is to address the lack of access to primary care providers and to dentists um, for Amherst residents. To close this gap, it's important to promote, support, and expand the Misante Health Center, who provides both clinical and dental care. It's also important to educate the Misante Health employees about the town's culture and its residents so they can better understand the needs of the community. And lastly, it's important to ensure the underserved communities like the elderly have access to transportation to get to needed services that helps them maintain a healthy lifestyle. All right, um, to conclude the community health assessment, um, we have a summary of our key findings. These are just some of the recommendations um, that we mentioned previously that fit nicely into the social determinants of health framework, which we used as a lens to do this assessment. Um, but like we all said, there's more uh, findings and recommendations in the full report. There are some limitations as there are with any assessment. Due to constraints in time, resources, and available data, this community health assessment was not able to investigate every health and concern um, of the community. While we did a sample, while we did sample from a variety of data sources and the community members, we recognize that there is more research to be done in order to get a comprehensive understanding of all the challenges and opportunities needed to address diverse health concerns of the community. And to wrap up, the assessment identified recommendations that the community can work together for in creating a healthier and more equitable Amherst. The recommendations um, aim to provide a roadmap for key stakeholders, community groups, and the town government to collaborate and prioritize efforts that will have a positive impact on the overall health of Amherst community. We also want to reiterate the health and well-being of the town is a responsibility of all town departments, organizations, and businesses not just the Public Health Department and the Board of Health. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Uh, thank you to Nancy and Anita for their support throughout the assessment and to all of the participants. A full finalized report with more context, quotes, and recommendations will be available to the public very soon. And we are looking forward to seeing how this assessment can be used as a guide to improve the health and well-being of Amherst residents. And we will now open the floor for some questions, if there are any but our contact info is on the screen for uh, any further questions. Kyle, thank you for saying Anita's name after I finished the introductions. I forgot to thank Anita Sara, who's a community member who's been very supportive and helpful um, to the students and myself during this whole pro process. She's volunteered to be a team member. Um, and thank you once again. And let me open up um, to the board members if they have any questions for you. Let's see. Board members, do you have any questions, comments? You know what, I wanna first ask to maybe not share. Can you stop? Um, 
there is yeah so we can mm -hmm. see that i okay. i just want to say as the health director thank you so much i know the work you've done and just how smart and organized you all have been and i'm really inspired um and i'm i'm um happy to hear that we'll get a completed report because you know i'm always interested in um, and how we can trans, you know, research translations. We have this good information, but how can we implement it? And I'd love to get my hands on that and let the community see it. And then I loved um, hearing, I think maybe it was Catherine, that, you know, we don't have to repeat this every three years, but we can continue on in key points. I think that's what you said, someone said. And so I'd be interested in finding out more about, about that. So it doesn't just end now. We can continue this. Is that what I heard? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, very cool. So Lauren, Pramila, Tim, do you have any questions or comments? Um, I, I wanted to thank the student team and they did an incredible job, you know. Uh, it's, uh, we know that it's not easy pulling all the data and <laughs> compiling them, analyzing and putting them into a nice recommendations. And so I, I applaud all your efforts. Thank you. What, what's very nice when you get the report, they have data in um, census tracts. So geographically, we will be able to see uh, a lot of the, the demographic data. Lauren, do you have a question or comment? Oh, sure. I was just going to say something quick. I, um, yeah, I, I've heard a lot of this and have lived a lot of this, um, uh, of what was said in the anecdotal reporting. I, I just wish that a public health campaign or a way to enliven the information, you know, to share it in the future. I hope that some, somebody can do that. Lauren, can you say that again? I, I missed that. I don't know if other people got I said I wish there was a way to enliven the information through a public campaign um through video or or something that that could be shared with the public yeah, i was wondering how you see some of the recommendations or all of the recommendations that you made uh translate into action um for the town um you know, would, would you make a presentation to the town council, for instance, as you have to us, or um, I, I'm just wondering sort of how how you uh, see that happening possibly? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, and we don't totally have the answer yet. I know Kyle is continuing to work um, in Amherst next year, and he's planning on implementing a lot of the recommendations um, through his, I think he, he'll be doing a practicum, I think. Um, so that's one way, I think, continuing to talk about it and present it, like you said, to maybe the town council would be helpful. Um, and it's something that definitely some future students can look into. I think, I know ne Neha and I are graduating, so we won't be on the project anymore, but there's always public health students at UMass who are looking for opportunities and um, they could possibly take over and start kind of presenting this to wider audiences, which would be great. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I think one of the great things about doing a needs assessment like this is you hear, you're not just getting data like on paper, on the computer, you're actually listening to people talk about their problems. And some of those problems are really big systemic things. But then some of them are just like, let's add a sharp box. Oops. Whoops. We no. lost you. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I guess some of it is easier to implement than other things. So mm -hmm. I think for the smaller things, maybe that'd be one town meeting and it's, you know, one and done. Just put some money into it. 
but other things are a lot harder to do. And that's why continuing this kind of community assessment would be a really good idea. I'm glad you brought up the um, uh, Musanti Health Center. It just seems to me like this is a tremendous resource for the town to have a federal, federally qualified health center in our midst. <clears throat> and it seems to me that it's very underutilized. Um, and I really would like to see, you know, some awareness being raised in terms of what's available and specifically in terms of, you know, people having difficulties finding primary care providers because they do have primary care providers and, and dental services where those are sorely lacking, you know, for the uninsured. So it would be really good to see something come out of, of that specifically in relation to the health center. I can just add that they, I think they have recognized that, or maybe you guys sort of sparked their talking about this, but they have a new diversity, equity, inclusion director. I think Kyle, you may have met her um, or Olivia has. So, so I, I see this as a great thing that you've identified and I know that they want to in, in, improve their um, uh, engagement with the community. But I see more foot traffic, you know, I can see their their office. So I think things are, are picking up. I hope. Other comments? Um, I, I think one thing that the students came across and talked about, um, and I used it when I was talking to the um, housing board, um, our vulnerable population have had students and people go and talk to them repeatedly. But, but our vulnerable populations, and this is what the students told me, um, are not seeing action. And they're tired of telling their stories. They're weary and they need action. So I hope that this process, which is a beginning of something that can be wonderful, is not just another wonderful academic piece that doesn't get used and implemented by the town. And as the students pointed out, the health of the town and the public health issues is not just the, the health department and the board of health. It, it encompasses all of the government um, entities and, and members of the community. So I think that was one of their concluding remarks that we, we have to really emphasize that it's not just the, the little health department and, and the board of health, which is really focused on regulations. Um, and I, I wanna thank the students once again for getting these voices and getting this data and getting this document, which I hope we can pub, uh, post the, the document on the on the on our website, um, and uh, I know Kyle uh, did a wonderful job inviting people and boards and the town council members all to come and hear this. And um, people weren't able to attend. I know there was some other town council subgroup meeting tonight because one of the um, town councilors reached out to me and said she really wanted to be here, but she's at this other meeting. So hopefully people will go online and listen to it. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you students once again. It's been a wonderful experience for me to work with you and see you grow, become leaders, and really contribute beyond academics to our town. It's been a wonderful process for me, and I hope a wonderful learning process for you to take to your future careers. I know Kyle's with us, and um, Emily just got an assistant director position at the Milton Health Department, so wow. these students are moving on to great places. Great, Emily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Kyle, we're fortunate to have you. And I hope um, Catherine and James can continue to, to be with us. And Niha, I wish you the best of luck when you uh, go back to your community to work. Are there any other 
comments or questions? So um, one I, quick suggestion. Uh, if there is any way to develop an executive summary of this document, just a one pager, key items, and that summary could be shared with the town council and different, like broadcast much more broadly so that they people can see the key key recommendations, you know, instead of reading the whole report. You know. This is just a suggestion. Great idea in community assessment team. We should probably have one final meeting um, to just wrap everything up um, and for me to tell you how wonderful you are again. Um, so Emily, maybe we could schedule that. I'll, I'll email you. Yeah, that works for me. We can figure that out later. Yeah. And I think that's excellent, Tim. Uh, Tim and, and Anita and I were talking about that and Anita can help work on that also. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you once again. Um, and I wish you all the best going forward in public health. And you're going to be an asset to public health no matter where you all go, because you've been a big asset to our town. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, take care, everybody, and we'll meet one more time quickly. <laughs> okay, thanks. And now we'll go on to the rest of the old business. So the LB, LGBTQ plus equity statement, I know I, I brought it up at the end of the last meeting and then I quickly put one together um, so that it could be moved forward right before um, I left for a, um, a wedding. So I don't know, I, 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 I saw um, a type error with one word repeated twice. I don't know what people's thoughts are on this document and if you had a chance to read it. Comments? Thoughts? <laughs> Do we want to make a motion on anything? Very thorough. Um, I didn't think anything was missing when I looked over it. So. I heard the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm meaning to my computer to try and hear. Yes, I said I looked over it and it seemed that the information presented was very thorough. I didn't see anything that should be added. Thank you. I also agree that it's very thorough, well written. Ramola? Sorry, yes, I agree. It, it is very thorough. And um, I, I wondered what you meant in terms of passing a resolution or, or proposing a resolution. So um, two years ago, we, we, we made a statement on racism, um, mm -hmm. uh, just a statement. And, and at our last meeting, I felt, and now it's been really exposed what has been going on in the schools, um, and I thought, because what's going on in the schools and also what's going on nationally, because we are concerned about the health of people, it would be beneficial for us just to have a statement. It's, it's, it's not a resolution, it's not an action, it's not a regulation, but to show what the board stands for and supports in relationship to LGBTQ plus um, community members and members at large in the region and statewide nationally. So that was the only reason why I brought it up 
Um, and when I brought it up, it was sort of like the tip of the iceberg of what was happening in the school. Since then, there have been mm -hmm. numerous meetings um, with the school committee and the schools and, and, and a lot has happened. But this is separate from the schools and the school committee. This is just a statement like our, our racism statement. Yeah. I don't know if people, I obviously feel it was important. That's why I brought it up. That's why I drafted it. I don't know if other people on the board feel that it's important for us to make this statement and have it posted on the, the Board of Health website. I think that would be worthwhile. Tim? So do we vote on this uh, statement? Yeah, well, this is a discussion, and then we should decide if we want to okay. vote on it. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't know how other people feel, but, you know, my uh, this is my last board meeting, and it was, <laughs> I, I thought it was a an important public health issue. That's why I raised it. That's why I wrote it. And that's why it's here today. We can act on it today. You can take it on to another meeting. Um, I, it, it's just a start. It was, I used it as a starting point. <laughs> I, I think the statement is good and uh, it's written well. Uh, you, you have done a really good job. And uh, I, I think we should act on this today. Is my <laughs> Ramala, Lauren, do you feel the same way? Yes. Can I hope? Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say, um, because my phone is acting up again, that there seems to be like a disconnect between what the Board of Health does and what the town council does and you know I think we're starting to get some other departments involved in health services and what needs to happen but just a resolution I, I'm not against it but I just want to comment and say that just state making a statement without like action steps and again like a campaign it doesn't really move um the community forward so it would be good to either work with other departments or work with the town council to create some action steps. That's that's a good point, Lauren. This could be used for the board to to take action in the future. Um, and we and and you can we can the 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 board and the health department can use it um, in, in the future to as they see fit. At minimum, it seems, you know, that it would be worthwhile to have a statement about where we stand on, on this issue. Um, and yes, hopefully it would lead to something more, but thank you for putting it together, Nancy. You're welcome. Um, if there's anyone have any other statements, otherwise, if we have a, a motion to accept this, um, I'll correct the one typo error and I'll put um, our names and the dates as we have on our racism statement and um, it can get out for, for signatures in the next month. Does anyone wanna make a motion? I can make a motion that we accept the LGBTQ plus equity statement as drafted by Nancy Gilbert and also the modification proposed uh, um, and uh, that's that's my you know motion thank you I'll, I'll second that okay so it's been moved and seconded to accept the lbgtq plus equity statement with the few changes um, um i'm going to ask for a vote um tim aye Ramola? Whoops. Aye. Lauren? Aye. And Nancy, aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and next on the agenda is the Board of Health Succession. Um, we are unfortunately losing the 
um, board of health. Oh, I'm, I'm just, the board of health, um, the health department, but we're losing the chair and we have two vacancies, but we're also losing the director of the health department, which comes up later, which is um, big changes. So um, I know Maureen said she would share the July meeting, but to move forward, you need one needs to decide on who's going to be the chair or how that position is going to be filled. And also the vacancies. And I talked with Jennifer earlier, the town does not start interviewing people for the vacant positions on the board until they're vacated, which means there's this huge gap with just three of you being on the board through the summer because it seems to take a while for the process to, to go through to get new appointees. Jen, do you wanna add anything to this? Um, I don't have much more to add than what you said. I know um, when I spoke to Paul Bachman, he said there were um, a few candidates. So hopefully we can get those going soon um, and uh, appoint people, but we're, you know, if anyone's interested in applying, you know, you can contact the health department or the town town hall. Okay, so I wish the board well uh, as it moves forward after this meeting. Um, new business: the geothermal well application for thirty nine Owen Drive, and Ed sent us material on that. Um, and the regist the driller's registration is up to date. Um, I don't know if people have any comments or concerns about um, this well, and if not, we can just move forward to have it um, accepted. Does anyone have any concerns about it? Okay, can I have a motion to accept the geothermal well for 39 Owen Drive? I'll make the motion. And a second? I could second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the uh, geothermal well on 39 Owen Drive. Tim? Aye. Premila? Aye. Lauren? I, I didn't see the, the information, so I'm just going to abstain. Okay, and Nancy, aye. So we have um, three votes, which is in favor of the geothermal well. Thank you. The next is Market Hill Road is um, a drinking water well application. And um, Ed sent the materials. He visited the site and he um, supports the well. Does anyone have any concerns or about the well? And if not, I have a motion to accept it. I make a motion to accept the uh, well application, drinking water well application in Market Hill Road. Okay, lot three, parcel 3C114. So we have it full. Okay. A second? I'll second oh. it. <laughs> All in favor, Premila? I I just wanted to ask a clarify, clarifying point. Is this, did I understand correctly that this lot is served by town water? Yes. But they want to create a drinking water well. Yes, and we've had that in the past. Sometimes mm -hmm. people prefer that than to hooking up. I don't, mm -hmm. um, because of the um, length of the, from the public source to the house. Mm -hmm. or, uh, people have different reasons why they want their own well. Okay, yeah, so I. Okay, Tim? I. Lauren? 
Lauren? Lauren's muted. I'll vote I. Um, okay, so we we don't have Lauren's vote, but we have three votes. Um, and one thing I want to make sure we we note that after the well is drilled, that there is water testing um, after its completion because that's in part of the regulations. And I want to make sure that that gets done and report gets to the board of health. So if we um, accept it with uh, and to make sure that there's follow up water testing. Okay, so that is all the. Old, old business, and now, uh, no, and that's the new business, and we're going to move on to the a Amherst Regional Public School COVID vaccine requirement, which um, Tim was on um, on September twenty seventh, twenty twenty one, when we voted for it. Um, Jen, do you want? I, I've done a little research, and Jen, I know you wanted to make a statement about the um, the vaccine uh, mandate uh, for public schools that we had voted on on sept in 2021 in September. Yeah, so not so much like a statement, but just sort of getting everyone sort of a sum a summary. But in the packet that the Board of Health members received, and also posted on the Board of Health web page, you can pull up the package that I put there, and it's the meeting minutes from September 27th, 2021, and the board um, voted to add vaccines against COVID using vaccines with full FDA approval um, as a requirement for students who attend public schools in Amherst. So the question today is, um, should this uh, uh, requirement continue? And if it want, if you want it to be continued, it does need to be reworded. At least that's my opinion. Um, um, this this um, requirement was done obviously during the early phases of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout and a lot of extreme measures that we were going through to save lives and prevent the collapse of the public health, you know, the, the healthcare system. And the thought was at the time to interrupt uh, transmission on a population level. So now we're two years out, um, people are more vaccinated. Um, uh, I don't know if we have herd immunity, um, but the de declared public health emergency is over. And now what I alluded to earlier is the vaccine we, we use now, the bivalent, is emergency use authorization, it's EUA. So it's not fully. Um, uh, approved by the FDA. So that's something that if you wanted it to continue, you'd have to say that we just, any emergency use authorization should be used. Um, but also I wanna say that um, it also affects summer camps because summer camps follow the school recommendations, some of them. So um, it's not just the school, it's summer camps. Also, this has not been um, required by the state um, by DESE, the Department of Early um, Education Learning, and it's not going to be re recommended. Um, so the state recommends certain vaccines for children, but not the flu vaccine and not the COVID vaccine. So that's what I just wanted to say and sort of get us up to speed. And I, I went into the CDC <clears throat> and in the end of, of February, they made a statement that 57% of children six months to 17 years have not received their first dose of COVID vaccine. So it makes enforcing mandates logistically and politically difficult. Um, and because other uh, precautions have been rolled back I think that we should lift this mandate and strongly recommend in the immunizations, um, but lift the mandate. I, I don't know what other people feel about it, but that was, was my thought. Um, I, I would I, like I, to see it strong. Oh, sorry, Tim, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to say, I would like to see it strongly recommended, but I agree in terms of, enforcement it doesn't make sense um 
so I do I do think we should remove the requirement. I also agree that's the same, you know, lifting the mandate and strongly recommending the vaccination. Warren? If, if I understand what you're saying correctly, you said that the to continue the mandate would have to be through emergency situations. And is that correct? No, it's um it's just it's just the way that they've designated this, these vaccines when they rolled out, they were all emergency use authorization. And then um, one or two got federally approved. And um, but now this bivalent is uh, emergency use authorization. So it's just the title to it. Um, I'm not sure if I explained that very well. I'm sorry, Lauren. But I'm asking if the bivalent, if it were to be used in an emergency situation, would there have to be a mandate? Well, we, we're giving the bivalent now to adults. So, you know, with doctor's orders, it's just, you know, it's being given across the, the, the country, but, but not mandated for the students at the school, at the public school. It, no one nationally mandates it. California that mandated at the same time we did have, everybody's walked it back um, and uh, lifted the mandate. Uh, as yes. I said, strongly recommend it. Does that clarify it, Lauren? Yeah, sorry, Lauren. I'm sorry if I didn't explain myself. My question is, if it were to be administered to a student or a camper, would it have to be under an emergency situation? That's what I'm asking. If it were to be administered. Well, people, the still, people can still opt to get it, but we're not gonna mandate they get it. Uh, I think um, Lauren is asking, it has to be uh, I mean, people, if they are going to take a vaccine, should it be in an emergency situation? It's not, a, I think it's uh, it's primarily anyone can opt in to take the vaccine. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. So even if it's emergency, it, it was originally emergency use authorized, even though the emergency is technically over, you can still opt to get the vaccine, correct? Yeah. Yeah, right, okay. it's just this this title that it has, and now we we don't even sort of <clears throat> acknowledge it as as much as we did before. I had to you know really look it up and see if it was federally approved or not because they're really used the same the same manner. Does that clarify it for you, Lauren? Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Um, so it's the the I believe it was the motion is to lift the mandate for COVID vaccine. So lift. Let's see. What was our exact? Yeah, the require is required. Is it, so. um, it is to lift that the Board of Health adds vaccine against COVID-19 using vaccines that have been uh, received full FDA approval to the list of vaccinations that are required, except for medical and religious exemptions for students to attend public schools in Amherst. So we, we are, are lifting that mandate and we're just strongly recommending that COVID-19 uh, vaccines are used um, along with other vaccines for children. Does that, does that fill it, Jennifer? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. You know, I'm looking at it, it's like we added it to the list and we could remove right. it. So the, now we're uh, removing it. Removing. From, yeah. So Tdap, polio, MMR, hep B, and uh, varicella are still there and COVID is off to go to school and camp in Amherst. So that's the motion. May I have a second? I can second it. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, Tim. Aye. Premua. Aye. Lauren. Aye. And Nancy. Aye. Okay. So we lifted that. Now we have the director's report. <clears throat> hey. Um, so again, this is in the packet that I mailed to um, the Board of Health members, and it's also available on the web page. But what I posted up there is the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District um, information report from 2022. So it's a surveillance report. Um, last year, we were partial members um, and we received their services. And again, going into this summer, we're now full members of the PVMCD. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I think everyone will really benefit from all the information that we're going to get um, from this, uh, this group. Um, you can go on and see the report that they sent. Um, but one thing, uh, just sort of as an example, is that they um, do weekly uh, trapping and testing. They have five sites around Amherst, and they put the approximate sites down in the report. So if you go down to Station Road, you're not going to find it because it's just an approximate uh, position. But they really outline the different traps they put out and what mosquitoes um, that they might be targeting. And then if we get um, samples or pools that are positive as the season progresses, it's really going to inform us how to educate and let the public know what's going on. So I think it's a great tool. Um, very excited about it. And I uh, suggest people check it out. So I was very impressed having been on multiple votes to get it in. I was very impressed where they, where they um, have all the, the locations of the testing sites. Yeah, it's really something like, mm -hmm. um, South of uh, the Station Road, you know, they're getting the um, mosquitoes that um, transmit triple E, but back at Village Park Drive around there, there's more that are um, West Nile virus. I mean, so it's really interesting. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, that's, a, a, that's sort of a big deal because we've been looking to join for a while. So mm -hmm. I feel that's a real accomplishment. Yes, thank you. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about just briefly is the opioid settlement money. Um, so I don't know what people know about this. Um, I can just tell you um, briefly what I'm aware of. I think it was like 2018, let me just look at my notes. Um, then Attorney General um, Healy um, started becoming involved with other states. Um, about lawsuits looking at um, different um, aspects of the opioid um, uh, epidemic. How did we get here? So they started some lawsuits and they looked at um, opioid manufacturers, opioid distributors, and pharmacies. And they really, um, uh, over the course of the years, um, started looking at how they really have um, uh, uh, fueled the opioid um, epidemic. So um, there's a huge amount of money that every U.S. state um, is going to be receiving. Um, I don't know exactly what um, Massachusetts is receiving, but I have a list again published of what Amherst is going to be receiving. And if you look at that number, it's about and it's spelled out per year, um, 25,000 to 30,000 per year up until 2038. So that's 20 years we're going to be getting this money. And it should be earmarked for um, looking at uh, different ways to increase um, working with disorders, overdose, um, deaths, and um, encouraging. Um, strengthening uh, different prevention, harm reduction treatments and recovery, and they're encouraging people to pool resources. So the town is gonna to be working with partners to figure out um, how we can use this money jointly together, and then also for the town of Amherst. 
Jen, do you know where the money's being deposited and how it's going to be followed? Does so, it go to general funds or does it go to the health department or? Yes, not the health department. So I don't know this, this specific grant money, um, but, you know, I think, you know, really open access, it's going to be very, you know, um, uh, very transparent about where, where funds are going. And the other part of it is, but I, I don't want to overspeak, but, but part of it is that we need to have a community input. So I'm, I've, you know, secured a room if, if I'm the one that's going to be doing that. And we'll have people in to discuss the money and decide where or to talk about where it should be allocated. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments on that? A lot of money over a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I hope it's used wisely. I know. I hope so too. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to do is this is not on the agenda. It come up in the last two days is air air quality. So I know with COVID, we've been talking about indoor air quality. Now we're talking about outdoor air quality. And on um, the town uh, web, the town webpage, there's a banner up across um, that we have that'll give updates on the latest um, particulate matter and what the quality is and where we are daily. And then they're also on the um, Amherst Health Department webpage. There's some other websites that you can go to. So the ones that um, I've been following posting is Air Now. That's the EPA. And then also the department, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection has really good web pages. So if you go to that, I'm going to click on it now. <clears throat> and you can see that our, our numbers are on a scale, I think it's a scale of a zero to 500. Um, earlier today, we were 160. Now it's 100, it's 111. So we're, we're lowering our group um, to... Um, unhealthy for sensitive groups. So, you know, it's it's a designation, but also if you go to these websites, you can see some guidance and how it impacts different people. So I think that's really important as, for us to follow now while it's happening. And just in the future, I think we're going to see this more and more frequently, unfortunately, but unhealthy hair. Unhealthy hair. And fortunately, we have a lot of masks available all over from COVID. So people yeah. can be urged to, to use it, use them outdoors uh, when the particular numbers are up. That's right. And the right mask at N95, not at N95. Yeah. 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 There are also some um, other monitors, low cost monitors um, called Purple Air um, that are around town that you can uh, log into and see what's going on. But they're not always greatly accurate. They're not greatly accurate. I think it's another piece of information. Um, some of them are very, you know, similar to what we see, like um, the the ones that are monitored by the EPA. I think there's one in Ware and Springfield. Yeah. And I, I sent a, a link out to board members for a, a, a good resource from a faculty member at UMass who this is that this is his area of expertise. Yeah, yeah. So it's really important health, you know, health matters that's going on right now. I know people with um, asthma are using their inhalers. You know, you worry about children, but it's just individual um, organizations are making their decisions now. Um, so nothing from MEMA or FEMA at this point. Um, and then the last thing on the agenda is the director's resignation. So I think most people know that I've had <laughs> I resigned May 19th and I'll be leaving at the end of July. And I've loved working here. Um, I live in Amherst. I believe in the power of all the people that have participated in local government and the excellent employees here. Um, and um, I'm, there are things I'm going to miss very much, but I've said this before, the public health scene in Pioneer Valley is pretty small, so I'll be around. Um, and then the final thing I wanna say is, you know, Lauren, it's been a pleasure working with you. This is your last, last month, last meeting. 
Um, I, you just added so much to this, this town. I was going to say for three years, but it was two years. But thank you so much for everything. I, you know, just personally, I'm going to really miss you. And um, I thank you. And Nancy, you've been the voice for public health so long. I just, uh, just admire you. You've been a mentor. And thank you very much. You're very welcome. And you've been such an asset to the town. My pleasure. We do have public comments. Um, on the agendas. So, um, but there are only two attendees, and I don't know if anyone wants to make a comment before. Okay, no, but topics not anticipated by the chair. So, this is my final meeting. I've been on the Board of Health for about 20 years. Um, I want to thank you, Jennifer. You started as a board member. You pay became the public health nurse. You saw us through difficult times of COVID. You never gave up, even though uh, there were so many challenges. And I know it would have been easy to give up, but you stayed with us. Um, you became the interim director twice, and then you became the director. Um, I admire you because, um, Someone always said, follow the money. And so I followed the money. We have this wonderful report. I've also, I, I wanna give people a teeny bit of history. I have worked with the Amherst Health Department since the 1970s when they had home care and they had school nursing all in the department in the health department. I was the continuing, the first continuing care coordinator at Cooley Dickinson in the mid seventies. And I made referrals over to the Amherst Board of Health. I've seen, I've worked with one, two, three, six directors since the seventies. I was on the community advisory board for the health department in the late eighties until the early nineties. And I've been on the board of health I believe it's since 2002, except for 18 months. Um, given that, I think that Jen has done an amazing amount of work given the staff she has and the limited budget she has. And uh, this may be difficult for the town to hear, but I don't think the town values the health department and what Jennifer and other directors have done. The community assessment sort of alluded to it. And if you follow the money, um, Northampton that has a population of 29,311, if you take out the grant money and you take out the inspectors, they spend about $900,000 a year. Um, East Hampton with a population of 16,211. And if you take out the inspector, they spend 232,200 per year. That's this year's budget. Amherst, I don't know what the final approval of, with 39,263 residents has a budget, uh, is this correct, $184,561. So I, I think the town government has to look at how much they wanna put in and how much they value the health department. Um, I, I've, I've spoken to Jennifer, I've spoken to Paul, um, the blueprint for public health put out by the state, we need to regionalize. And I think this is a huge opportunity for Amherst to regionalize. I see Hampshire County as a health department with Amherst as the lead for east of the Connecticut River and Northampton as the lead west of the Connecticut River. And I think we need a community advisory board 
um, as you as you talked about with the, the money for this opioid, that would be a perfect place for a community advisory board. So those are my comments. I want to wish all the board members who have been so helpful and supportive and have worked so hard during my um, time as chair and um, I wish you all well and hope you can continue all this work. And um, I, I just wanted to go on record saying that, that I think the town uh, powers to be really need to have to step up and support the health department and, and public health in the town of Amherst. Because I think you've done, an ex I think the board has done extremely well. And I think Jennifer, you have done extremely well given our limited resources. And I think the town does need to put more into the resources for the health of the town. So with that, with that big topic not anticipated, um, thank you all once again. I wish you well. If, if you want any of my input or my comments, you can contact me and I'm off the record and, uh, after June 30th, so I can say whatever. Um, but I, I wish you all well, and I thank you. I thank all, all four members for all that they have done, working on the regulations, looking at things, researching things, commenting. I, I just thank you all from the bottom of my heart for supporting um, health, public health in the town of Amherst. So thank you all. And with thank you, that. Nancy. Thank <laughs> you for your dedication and your hard work. You're most welcome. And I'm, um, so I need a motion to adjourn our meeting. My last chair meeting. <laughs> and Lauren, thank you for coming on and bringing up a lot of new points. But you'd be great on the advisory board if the health department ever, a board of the health department ever gets That's That would be a perfect place. <laughs> so a motion to adjourn. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Nancy, for the leadership and uh, also for Lauren for bringing new voice to this uh, board. Oh, uh, it's so you. amazing, you know, to have you both in, in the on the board. We'll be missing thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Someone to second it? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adjourn. Lauren? You, okay, I wish you well. And Aye. keep up all the work you've done. Premola? Aye. Tim? Aye. And Nancy? Aye. So thank you all. Good night. And I hope you get new board members ASAP. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.